Hey everyone. And we have no picture. That's always good. Let's cut that in. And there we go. Hey everyone, welcome to the Green Monk TV uh, Technology for Good Hangout. This is the fourth episode in the series. Uh, I've been joined today on the show by Abesh Bhattacharji from India. Abesh, how are things down there? Not too bad. Not too bad. I I was I was just wondering because I mean I have seen uh, you do a couple of these shows and I trust me it was not intentional but uh, <laughs> I think it was good after all that I just managed to uh, see that you're on air and I joined you. Oh, uh, thank you so much. It's thank always so a pleasure much. to listen to you, listen to you. Thank you, Avesh. Thanks. Thank you, Avesh. We have a bit of a technical issue today. Um, for some reason, uh, the uh, Google Hangout control room application is not working and as a consequence the image is reversed so you can see the logo here on screen uh, is backwards and also when I put up the web pages they're going to be reversed as well sorry about that um, nothing I can do about it I've, I've been trying for the last 20 uh, minutes to flip it around I, I, see, I see the logo pretty fine I mean it, it, it's it's okay for me but is it readable is it not backwards no, it's not. It's it's probably ah. readable for me. Ah. So it's just back. It's just it's backwards just back, on my screen. So that's screen. okay. No, that's okay. <laughs> Fantastic. That's even better. Uh, the, hopefully the web pages will be legible as well then. So uh, we're going to go through a couple of quick stories here. Uh, I'll just flip over to the stories themselves and we'll start talking about them. I best jump in at any time with any comments you have as well. The first story I wanted to talk about, and um, like I said, I'm not sure if this is legible. Uh, Abesh, can you read that? Okay. Yeah. Perfectly fine and not reversed. So, oh, yeah, good. I mean, not not very legible, but I can at least make out the head header. Okay, great. So it, it talks about how Google is working on a 10 gigabit internet speed uh, in 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 San Francisco. They they've already rolled out a one gigabit. Uh, internet speed service, a fiber service in Kansas City, and now they're working on a 10 gigabit one, which is just absolutely incredibly fast uh, you know if, if, if you had if you had speeds of 10 gigabits you know movies would come down in seconds at, 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 the, at, the, at the slowest the when, if you have a 10 gigabit internet connection at that point uh, your own connection is not going to be the bottleneck for any applications what's going to be the bottleneck is the servers in in the data centers that you're getting the information from be it movies be it cloud applications be it whatever to give you an idea of what this uh, what this means currently my internet connection from Movistar is 8.49 so uh, Going from megabits to gigabits is a is a thousand-fold increase. So going from eight megabytes to a thousand megabytes or one gigabit, you know, would be a uh, 120. Is it 120-fold increase? Uh, and then to get it up to 10, uh, you know, moves it up to a thousand-fold increase. So it would be phenomenal for me if if I were to get anywhere near that kind of speed but that's not going to happen with Movistar as my uh, as, as my internet service provider anytime soon unfortunately so uh, next story up uh, on the energy front and I have a couple of energy related stories today uh, the first one I came across was a story from Intel on how they're coming up with a new uh, graphics chip. It's come out of the research labs. The graphics chip, uh, it, it aims to cut down drastically on the amount of energy being used by devices which, you know, need graphics chips or use their main chip as a graphics chip. So they're saying here that this graphics core incorporates several new features that allows it to improve energy efficiency by 40%, essentially giving longer battery life for the same performance or improving performance when you really need it. Now, I know it's, it's typically you talk about the gamers who use graphics chips, but even graphics chips uh, can be used in smartphones. So if you're getting a 40% increase in the battery life of your phone, that is pretty significant. It means you can consume the same amount of information, uh, but use you know 40% less energy. So, uh, excellent news on energy saving right there. The next Tom, news. Uh, yes. Sorry yes. to interrupt. Did you did you change the headlines because I'm, I'm I still see the Google working on the gigabit internet speeds headline. Ooh, I I, I, I did. I did. Sorry. Let Sorry. Me, okay. Let me double check that double here. Double check that here. That's annoying. Let me just 
go back to my side. Yeah, for a I got it now. You have it now? You have it now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, right oh. now you should be seeing a headline saying Tiny Green Charge Networks Charge Peter Plant. Yes, sir. Good. Okay. So, so uh, th this is a story um, about a startup company called Green Charge Networks, and they're planning a big announcement for next week. Uh, we're not sure yet what the announcement is, but the company themselves are in the demand response space. So demand response, if you're not familiar with it, is a technology which uh, gets energy consumers, electricity consumers, to uh, move their some of their loads from their energy consumption, and this can be industrial consumers or it can be residential consumers. Uh, they move their consumption to match the times of production of the utility companies. So, for example, uh, in a residential situation, you're not going to change the time you make your dinner in the evening. That's always going to be around the same time. But the time you wash your dishes or the time you put on the clothes washer or the dryer, you know, they, those are movable loads. Or the time you heat your water if you have an electric water heater, those are movable loads that, you know, you don't really care if it happens between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. As long as it happens sometime in that window, you're not, you're not that fussed when it happens. Or, or charging an electric car, same thing. So uh, if, if you can move those loads uh, to times when A, electricity costs less, and B, there isn't as much demand for electricity, then the utility company doesn't have to build an extra plant to meet the peak demand uh, that, 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 that occurs at particular times in the day. So uh, this company, Green Charge Networks, they've a combination of a storage system, a lithium-ion battery system, along with software uh, to, to analyze when electricity is most likely to be required. And they can take companies off grid or reduce their demand from the grid at times when the demand is high by switching over to the lithium ion battery uh, system that they have. So it, it's a nice little system. It doesn't just um, it doesn't just save on energy consumption at peak times, which is great because that, you know, that, that has significant uh, carbon savings, but it also saves people and companies money because uh, the, at times of high demand, energy costs more. Uh, and they, they say in this article here uh, how much they're saving. And can I find it? Probably not, but it's in the article. And all these articles that I'm showing now, <clears throat> They will all be in the show notes at the end. So if you don't, if you can't, well, obviously you can't see the URLs now because the text is too small. But like I say, I'll have the links to all these articles in the show notes at the end of the show. The next story I saw in the energy space, and uh, again, hopefully the uh, the the um, screen is switched over, Abesh, there that you're seeing it. Uh, if if not, let me know. But it's a. Story. I do. I do. Great, great. It's a story out of the New York Times, and it's a nice little story uh, from the Home and Garden section, interestingly, but it's talking about LED lights and the switch over from incandescents to LED lights. And it's a long article, goes through it in a lot of detail, trying out different lighting systems. And, you know, it, it talks about ones from uh, Lighting Research Center, ones from uh, other companies, talks about the, the Energy Star certification that's required, uh, which ones are better than others. Personally, I've tried several different types of LED lighting systems out in my house, and I've found uh, the Philips Hue ones seem to be the best currently, uh, if you'll pardon the pun. Uh, but, you know, have a look through the article, see what you think yourself, um, and, you know, Everyone is needing to move to uh, LED lighting systems or low energy lighting systems in Europe and the US at least because in those territories, I'm not sure about other territories, but in Europe and the US, incandescents are being phased out uh, by law. So uh, the CFLs and the LEDs are where people are moving to. CFLs are cheaper, uh, but they're higher consumption and they don't last as long. LEDs are more expensive at the start, but over time, because they last longer, they save energy and they save money. Uh, Tom, Avesh. <clears throat> sorry, if just I, I I just wanted to uh, say a little bit here. Do, so uh, um, in India, it's it's mostly have been uh, we have been using those tube lights that we used to call those long tubes. The fluorescents. Uh, yeah, the fluorescents. But I can see they're slowly moving to the CFLs. 
uh, I mean, courtesy of one of my uh, childhood buddies, who's like, who's right now in Philips. I mean, he. I mean, uh, I I got a couple of these LED lamps as 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 a gift, and uh -huh. they're they're really good. I mean, the thing is, uh, what uh, Philips has done here, because uh, as I said, we're just moving on to CFL lighting right now, and LED would take some time to gain a foothold. So um, Philips has taken uh, uh, they they actually produce uh, what do you call that uh, dias or or small. Uh, and or oh, the diodes. and candles, oh, the diodes. yeah. Uh, Diaz are actually an Indian uh, earthen lamp, okay. right? Okay. So they they've got LED versions of that, and a lot of these are used for just uh, what do you call that? I mean, like uh, making your home look good. I mean, decorating your houses. Uh -huh. And uh, I think that's a very niche area and a very nice area. I mean, the utility is also good. I mean. They've made the uh, the earthen lamp to be in a way that when you light it up and you want to sort of uh, shut it down, you just blow on it and it goes. So quite a niche market, but uh, I think LED lighting, I have been impressed myself. I think uh, you, you talked about the hue. I mean, that's something that's prohibitively costly here. Uh, but uh, I mean, for, for a lamp. Uh, but I would lo love to try that out any anytime that I have a chance to. Sure. Thank you for sure. listening to me. No, 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 no problem at all. Um, I I was uh, given a present by Philips of a, a Philips Hue kit. So uh, this is one of the, the, the Philips Hue bulbs here. Um, and I got three of those and the little bridge the that, they bridge that they use. Um, um, it's an interesting, do, little, interesting system. little system. Did you do a review of it, or are you planning to do a review of it? I, I have a review I, I have done, a review uh, done uh, on, video. Uh, on video. I haven't published I haven't it yet. I just need to tidy it up a little, before, it it up a little before I publish it. I have it up on the Green Monk site in the next couple of days. days. Awesome. Monday, Tuesday, next week, Tuesday next week of the latest. I'll, I'll keep an eye out. Thank you. Cool. No worries. So the, the next story that I came across uh, that was of interest was uh, this one out of California, where a a new generation site, a solar generation site, is after coming online. It's called Ivanpa. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, it, it generates about 392 megawatts of power from solar, which is pretty impressive. Um, they're using 300,000 mirrors. Each mirror is seven foot high, excuse me, and 10 feet wide and controlling them with computers to focus the light from the sun onto these solar power towers uh, where they boil water and use the steam to drive turbines. So it's a pretty straightforward system really, it's just using a concentrated light from the sun concentrated by mirrors onto a central point at the top of the tower behind which is water which is boiled and uh, produces steam and drives turbines. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I have to say I'm a little disappointed that they're using water uh, rather than anything else. There is a similar technology, we, we have a number of those uh, solar power towers here in Spain, very close to me in Seville, and one of them in a place called Torresol, um, they're using molten salt instead of water, and molten salt uh, it, it holds significantly more temperature. It's got a much higher heat capacitance than water. And as a result of that, because they're heating the molten salt instead of heating water, the uh, molten salt can hold the temperature for far longer. And so when the sun goes down, you can still generate power because the molten salt is still hot. And it, they use the molten salt to boil water. And what happens is Torresol has become the first place in the world where they're able to produce power from solar from solar power, they're able to produce electricity from solar power 24 hours a day, which is incredibly impressive. Uh, so I'm surprised they didn't go for something similar in Avanpa, but even so, it's it's nice to see that coming online. Um, another story uh, in the renewables space, and we're seeing that Donald Trump, uh, who objected to um, a, a, a wind farm, an offshore wind farm in Scotland, and he's been objecting to it for a long time through the court system, and he's been holding it up and holding it up and holding it up. Well, his, his final chance to hold it up has been thrown out by the courts in Aberdeenshire after a Scottish judge deemed the government had followed the correct procedures in approving the scheme. So the scheme is going to go ahead. 
uh, Vattenfall, who are one of the uh, 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 contractors, uh, confirmed that it had pushed back the development by two years, which means the project is unlikely to deliver power until 2017. And be they're blaming that because of the legal challenges and setbacks uh, when local councillors rejected the planning application and because of uh, Donald Trump's interference. But now it's finally been all the, all the legal challenges are out of the way and that uh, wind farm is going to go ahead. So that's good news there. In the electric vehicle space, uh, I saw a couple of good stories this week. Uh, one of them was an initial 20 vehicles uh, are, are, have been uh, brought to London to serve as taxis in the London taxi fleet. And they're going to be followed by a further 50 vehicles later this year. They've been manufactured by the Chinese bid company, the BYD. And uh, they, they can travel 186 miles on a single charge. And after that charge, they go back to base, get recharged, and then go off out in the street again. Uh, the London has also got some electric buses on its fleet. Uh, two single-decker buses hit London streets in December. Uh, and uh, there are going to be six more in, introduced over the course of this year. Uh, London has introduced zero emission hydrogen buses as well and is currently trialing 120 buses that run on cooking oil and it intends to grow its 600 strong hybrid fleet to 1700 by 2016. So fantastic news there on uh, low carbon transport in London and it's badly needed because the pollution in London is pretty dire. Uh, some, more, some other news in the uh, electric vehicle space coming from NASA, from their global climate change site. And they talk about how they've been monitoring their own electric vehicle fleet to see the carbon emissions reductions that it has introduced. And they say that the uh, emissions reduction are far greater than expected. They're about 10 times what they thought they would see. So that's interesting. Very few, uh, very little data is available on electric vehicle fleets to date, and this is one of the first ones. Uh, so it's great to see that it's, you know, 10 times what they, what they assumed it was going to be. Uh, hopefully we'll see more companies producing more data on the carbon reductions from introductions of electric fleets. The data there is far too sparse. In the Internet of Things uh, space, uh, this week I saw this story coming from Kevin Toffel. It's on the GigaOM site, and he's talking about six billion new devices uh, slated to connect to the Internet of Things in 2014. So uh, even if we just talk about uh, or, or revert back for a second to that Philips bulb that I showed a second ago, that's going to be one of those six billion things connecting to the internet because that bulb is one of three bulbs that I have in the house which is connectable to the internet and controllable remotely over the 3G network which is something I'll demonstrate in the review of the Philips bulb that I do that I'll publish next week. So with the uh, with the Internet of Things coming on stream and really taking hold and home, energy, home area networks taking hold we're seeing a lot more devices now that are that are you know connectable to the internet. So that's where the, the six billion number comes from. And they're saying, according to this, this this comes from research from a company called IHS. And according to the according to Kevin in this article, that's just the tip of the iceberg. IHS expects another 19.42 billion devices, which is an incredibly specific number. We'll say close to 20 billion devices connecting to the internet between 2015 and 2017. So, you know, just looking around me here at my desk, I'm looking at a camera, which is connectable to the internet, uh, just a, a Canon EOS DSLR camera, my smartphone, the Philips bulb, my Fit uh, watch uh, device, um, you know, and there are three or four other things, my laptop, obviously, my tablet, uh, my computer, all these kind of things. So the number of things connecting all the time is increasing and set to increase even more. Uh, speaking of wearables and the, the Fit band that I have, uh, the Fitbit band that I'm wearing, uh, I saw this story about one called a FlyFit. And the FlyFit is a, it's similar to the, the Fitbit. This is a Kickstarter campaign, by the way. 
so this device doesn't exist yet. Uh, th this the 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 people who are trying to develop this FlyFit have got two hundred and sixty-five backers so far, giving them twenty-six thousand dollars, and they're looking for ninety thousand to develop this. So this this device may never actually. Uh, appear because they, they haven't reached their goal yet. Now they have 38 days to go to reach their goal so hopefully they'll get there. The reason I'm talking about it though is it, it's an interesting concept. It's a it, it's a wearable device similar to the Fitbit and the Jawbone Up and all those other devices. The difference with this one is you wear it on your ankle. Now stop and think about that for a second. The Fitbit that I'm wearing, it's on my hand, it's on my wrist, and it's trying to measure the uh, steps that I walk. Or if I go swimming, it would try and measure that. Or cycling. When I go, I, I don't cycle because I'm on crutches at the moment. But I, my, my, my doctor has me on an exercise bike to try and you know, make sure that the muscles in my leg don't waste too much. So when I want to measure the, uh, the exercise bike, what I do is I take the Fitbit off my hand and I put it into my jeans pocket and that way it does measure the movement. But this device fits on your ankle. So it's constantly you know, measuring your walking, or if you were swimming, it would measure your swimming, or if you were uh, sleeping, that's no difference. But you know, if you're cycling, it's no problem as well. And there's a, there's a nice little video there on the site. And again, the, the link for this will be in the show notes. I think it's a nifty little idea. Having said that, it, uh, Apple are about to blow this space away, by all accounts, with their new iWatch. We'll see what comes out there. So. Uh, you know, they, they, they moved into the iPod space when they brought out the first iPod, or the MP3 player space, I should say, when they brought out the first iPod, and they totally disrupted that. They totally disrupted the, the, the phone space when they brought out the, the iPhone. They invented the tablet space, and now it looks like uh, they're, going to do, they're going to have a go at the wearable space as well. We'll see what they bring out. The next thing in the Internet of Things space I saw was news out of Microsoft. And uh, Microsoft have uh, basically created an Internet of Things team. So you know that the Internet of Things is starting to jump the shark when Microsoft start getting on board as well. OK, that was a cheap shot. <laughs> but uh, you do start to take it seriously, though, when, when Microsoft are getting involved. Uh, what they've done is they've taken what was formerly their Microsoft embedded team, and they've renamed it, and it's now their Internet of Things team. They've brought in people from outside, and you can see some of the people there. Uh, Steve, and I don't know how to pronounce Steve's surname. It looks like a Portuguese surname, or maybe Basque with the X, or maybe Catalan with the X in there, Texiera or something like that. And Jonathan Smith. So the, you can see their LinkedIn profiles there uh, of people on their team. And there's a good uh, breakdown of this story here by Mary Jo Foley, who's a long time uh, analyst on things Microsoft. So it's a good piece. It's in the ZDNet site. Uh, Mary Jo Foley wrote it up. And again, the link will be in the notes. More Microsoft news. And Microsoft denying reports that they're filtering the Chinese language Bing searches. According to this piece in the register, uh, uh, the Guardian noted that a number of Chinese language activist blogs are reporting that results they're seeing on uh, searches within the US are not showing up uh, on, on Ch Chinese language searches. So uh, this, uh, this has been a problem for a lot of search companies who are trying to do business in China. Uh, Yahoo seeded, and so did Google, and they started filtering the results. But then Google backed out and stopped. Bing or Microsoft are saying that Bing doesn't do it and that it's a misconfiguration of their uh, Bing in China and that they're going to go ahead and fix it. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, moving on, uh, another Microsoft story. Microsoft's OneDrive, which is their answer to the likes of Dropbox, uh, they're now offering free storage for referrals and a camera roll backup. So if you have OneDrive and you refer friends to it, you can get extra space in OneDrive. Uh, it'll offer up to an extra 8 gigabyte of storage for users when they complete certain tasks, as in turn on your camera backup and you know, bring friends in. Having said that, you know, copy.com gives you 50 gigabytes. Uh, Dropbox gives you loads of gigabytes as well. Uh, Kim.com's mega, which is, I think it's mega.co.nz, gives 50, megabytes, or 50 gigabytes as well. So up to an extra 8 gigabytes, uh, I don't know. 
you know, if you're in OneDrive, this could be handy. If you're not in OneDrive, it's a me too story. Robotics. Who doesn't like robots? Well, uh, according to the BBC News Science and Environment site, there's this uh, first time um, we've seen tiny motors controlled inside a living human cell. So what's happened here is scientists have created these little nanomotors and they've placed them inside living human cells and they've managed to steer them magnetically within those cells so they're, they're, they're able to move where these little nanomotors are within living human cells. I gotta say this is pretty impressive stuff. It's, it's kinda scary, I mean if you've seen the movie Inner Space uh, with with Dennis Quaid and Martin Short back in 1987 then you know this will be a bit familiar to you but this isn't quite like that because they won't be shrinking people and putting them down inside little little space <laughs> vehicles and putting them inside human cells what they're doing is they've got these little nanomotors they're putting them inside people or living cells at least not people yet but living cells and they're able to manipulate them and you know, for nanomedicine, for uh, at attacking cancer cells, this holds incredible, incredible potential. Another robot story on the BBC site, which was uh, it was on the site this morning, in fact, uh, no, yesterday, the 13th, sorry, yesterday, was this one where uh, U.S. scientists have developed small robots that behave uh, like uh, they say termites here, basically, or ants. Uh, basically, these little robots, uh, they're capable of acting independently uh, and they're able to build structures. There's a little video of them at work here. And what the, what the scientists have done, uh, it's, the, the research comes out of Harvard, what they've done is they've uh, created a kind of platform where they tell the little uh, robots what they want built and then the robots go away and build it independently. And the idea is that instead of having complex robots, these are very simple ones that follow very simple sets of instructions, any of them are replaceable. It's, it's a bit like, you know, if you think of an ant colony, if a couple of ants get killed, the ant colony continues on. So uh, it, it's a decentralized approach to robot, robot programming. Uh, and, you know, it can have huge advantages over sophisticated systems where you have one centralized computer, you know, uh, or one centralized robot, which is uh, very complex. You know, if it if something happens to it, it could be catastrophic. Moving on from there, I saw this article in the personal tech section of the New York Times, uh, and this is one that's going to generate controversy. And I've already seen uh, there's an answer to it from someone. I've I've forgotten where. I'll I'll, I'll come back to that next week probably, but. This is about uh, the obsolescence that's inbuilt in the uh, technology sector. Basically, uh, it's not just the obsolescence that's built in by the manufacturers, but also by the lack of standards often. And the first um, example that's used here is the Barnes & Noble Nook. Uh, you know, or if you think of uh, Betamax versus VHS, uh, if you bought a Nook back in 2005, or no, when was it? Uh, whenever it was launched, uh, then you're in a kind of a sorry state now because the Nook has all but gone away, and Barnes and Noble have fired their staff who were developing the Nook, basically. So it's you know you you bet on the wrong horse. Uh, so using that as kind of a context. Uh, this article talks about you know which particular uh, hardware and, and and services you should be using to make sure that your 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 investments are not uh, don't go the same way as an investment in the Nook, <coughs> and it talks about for hardware uh, buying Apple hardware. Now I know a lot of people will rail against that suggestion. Uh, I I don't. Um, I've been an Apple purchaser for a long time now. Uh, I, I've, I've used Windows systems. I was a Windows system administrator for a large company, uh, so I know how to manipulate Windows systems. I had a Windows machine myself. Um, I was responsible for Windows networks, uh, for SQL servers, for um, Exchange servers, for ISA firewalls, all that kind of stuff. So I know I know both systems inside out and upside down. What I will say is that 
any Apple kit I've had, I've had absolutely no problem reselling it afterwards. I've never, I've never sent Apple kit to landfill. It's always, always, always been resold. Uh, so it holds its resale value incredibly well. And that holds true for, um, for desktop computers, for laptops, for iPhones, and I haven't tried to sell uh, an iPad yet. Uh, it talks about, uh, th this article also recommends using Google services uh, because uh, they, 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 they're, they're ubiquitous, uh, they'll work on any device, uh, they back up your photos, uh, and they allow you uh, afterwards to export if you want. Uh, I use it all the time. I use Google services. Uh, I use Google Docs and spreadsheets all the time. I use uh, Google uh, uh, Google Plus to back up all my photos on my phone, etc., uh, etc. Et it it also recommends buying media from Amazon, and that's again something I do all the time. I buy all my books uh, from the Kindle store. I don't have a Kindle, but I use the Kindle application uh, on my on my tablet, uh, or on my phone, or on my desktop, so I, I can view my my uh, purchases that way. I don't like the DRM that comes with uh, the books purchased on, on in the Kindle store, so I strip the DRM out. And the last thing he talks about connectors, so that's connect not physical connectors, but connecting applications, the likes of using Dropbox and, and Evernote. So some good advice there. Uh, some people, as I say, will rail against it, but for me, the advice holds true. OK, some planet-wide news at this point. Uh, we'll step back a bit and take a kind of a macro view. And uh, this was uh, a story sent to me by our own uh, Julianne Leary in, in Red Monk. I hadn't spotted it myself. But Wendy Schmidt, who is um, uh, the wife of Eric Schmidt from Google, uh, has launched this X Prize. Uh, it's worth two million dollars. It's a competition to improve our understanding of ocean acidification. The oceans, if you're not aware, are becoming more acid because they are dissolving the increased CO2 that's in the air. So they're becoming, uh, so carbonic acid is building up in the ocean. The oceans are becoming more acidic and that has effects on sea life. We need to understand that better and to do that, this X Prize has been launched to help us understand it. Whoever comes up with the best way of understanding it will win one of two one million dollar prizes. So uh, it's on oceanhealth.xprize.org. As I say, the links will be in the notes. You can check it out afterwards. Other news, again from the oceans, and this time uh, this is a story about whale watching uh, from space. So one of the biggest issues around trying to estimate whale populations is it's hard to estimate whale populations. You know, they live underwater. Uh, they come up to breach sometimes, but for the most part, they're underwater and they're hard to see. If you're in a boat, they could be directly under you. You can't see them. So up until now, you know, scientists have tried tagging. And they've also tried aerial photography, so going up in a small plane and circling around and trying to count them or using photographs taken from small planes. But this is costly and expensive. Now, however, uh, scientists have demonstrated that it's possible to do this using satellite photography. So you can log into the satellite from the comfort of your desk in your research lab and get a reasonably accurate count of whales in an area from space. So this uh, this should help with conservation efforts for whales. It's a it's a great use of that technology. Uh, speaking of planetary wide stuff, um, there's a good article here on the Microsoft Green blog, where it talks about Microsoft's impact on biodiversity through offset investments. Uh, offsets are something that people kind of you know, have mixed feelings about, but in this uh, in this piece, there's quite a detailed run through of how Microsoft's offset investments and Microsoft are offsetting their their carbon footprint. They want to be carbon neutral, so what they're doing is uh, anywhere where they're they're not carbon neutral, they're buying offsets. They're putting money into things that are carbon negative to try and counteract their uh, their carbon footprint, and they're they're. They have two big projects. One is in Madagascar and the other is in Indonesia. And there's quite a bit of detail in this article on how those projects are helping with biodiversity globally. So that's 
fascinating news there. Some more miscellaneous stories that I saw. Oh, actually, one more from the from the planetary one, and it's one on Apple, Apple computers, and their crackdown on conflict minerals. So this is an interesting story, uh, where they talk about how their how the suppliers they're using, uh, they 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 talk about how difficult it is to say whether their stuff is conflict free. Okay, so that's that that sounds like a bit of a cop out until you say. When you, when you read the report, which actually says that 59 of their smelters were compliant with the guidelines about being conflict-free, a further 23 of those smelters have agreed to be audited by the, conf the conflict-free smelter program, meaning their status will soon be known, but a further 104 of their smelters, their status is unknown. So that gives you an idea of the kind of scale of the challenge that they're facing. Uh, the director of Congo Calling, a UK-based campaign group calling for greater transparency in the sourcing of minerals, uh, told the BBC that Apple's announcement was to be applauded and not just Congo Calling but also Greenpeace lauded Apple for this move. Intel have done something similar and I reported on that a couple of weeks back and a lot of this is uh, because there's been a, a call for suppliers to be more transparent by this year. So we'll see some more of these announcements come out this year, and that's all good. Some other news that came out uh, from Facebook. We saw Facebook change their algorithm late last year. It was reported on February 10th this year, which caused the uh, traffic to sites like Upworthy suddenly falling off, which is no great loss. Upworthy is a, a site which just trawls for traffic with clickbait headlines. Uh, so to see that, see their traffic fall off, it's no bad thing. Uh, this was one I debated uh, talking about. Uh, I saw it and I kind of wondered, you know, the, the name of the Hangout is Technology for Good. Um, and this story is about the U.S. Army testing a smart rifle a scope, a telescopic site uh, made by a company called Tracking Point. And the idea of this scope is that uh, it's, uh, it's got a Linux computer built into it. And with the Linux computer built in, it's able to uh, decide whether or not a target is properly sighted. Uh, so the soldier holding the gun aims at a target, tags him with a laser, and then it won't let the soldier shoot until the rifle is properly lined up with the target. As soon as it's properly lined up, then the soldier can shoot. So it vastly increases the soldier's uh, fire or shoot to hit ratio, which, you know, helping kill people is never a good thing, really. On the other hand, if it helps a soldier if it helps a soldier not shoot innocent people, I guess that could be considered a good thing. And hence the kind of conflict I had about, you know, whether to whether to say this is a good thing or not. It's a technology story, no doubt. Uh, as long as the, sh the, the soldiers are not shooting innocent people, I guess, by mistake, I guess that's that's a good thing. The last story I'm talking about today is one where we see... Um, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, the Zuckerbergs, donating $1 billion from their personal wealth uh, towards philanthropy, philanthropic uh, ventures. Now, if you look at 50 donors in the US, the top 50 donors donated uh, $4.7 billion altogether. Of that uh, of that seven, sorry, seven point seven billion dollars. Of that seven point seven billion dollars, one billion came from the Zuckerbergs. So nearly thirteen percent, thirteen percent of the money given by the U.S.'s top fifty donors last year was given by Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, which is pretty impressive. And you know, it's a call to action for the other. 
the, the others in what's called the one percent in the U.S. It's a, it's you know step up to it. This is uh, this is Mark Mark Zuckerberg. For all the criticism he gets, this is him putting his his money where his mouth is and stepping up to the show. So kudos to to Mark for that. And uh, that's all the stories I have for you this week. Um, thank you for, for joining the show. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Um, Abesh, anything you want to say before we cut out? No, thank you. It was, it was great. I, I think I'll uh, try and see if I can be uh, regular here. Excellent. Excellent. That would be fantastic. So uh, with that, I'll uh, say thanks to everyone for, for joining the show. And uh, we hope to see you next week. As I said earlier, join the show. The links to the articles that I referenced will all be in the show notes. Uh, so and I'll post that on Twitter and on Facebook as well. So you'll be able to see those and catch those later and read those stories in your own time. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Have a happy St. Valentine's Day and have a great weekend.